how are you? Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, of course, we're also very excited. Welcome to the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center. Uh, it's a gateway to all of our 19 pueblos and also to the different uh, nations and tribes, including the great Navajo Nation and also Hickory and Muscalero Apaches. Today, we're very excited to express our true art of what started with my, my, my people. As I come to you, I'm no better. We look equally. I don't look above you or below you. As in generation before me, we introduce ourselves in our language. Navajo is more of a generic name. When we say Navajo, deep inside we're saying Dene. That's who I am. As Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue, ran into this really beautiful little island, assuming that he's back in India and call us Indians. I think the truth of the matter is, luckily he wasn't going to Turkey. <laughs> we end up with the name Turkey, of course. Thank you for coming. As we invite you to shemakoliwa.com, you can actually also view our beautiful handcrafted items on sale that are for sale through our website. We, want, we invite you to, to take a look at our website. As I come to you, my introduction was we believe that we have emerged through the underworld. In Navajo, we call it As we emerged through the underworld, our beautiful Dinetra surrounds with the four sacred mountains. Officially, it's seven, but what's around us is our four sacred mountains. Believing in all those wonderful beliefs, as I look at our beautiful basket, at, uh, is a gift from Yok uh, Sun, white shell woman. Navajo, they're very matrilinean, so we take the mother's side. As I introduce my clan, Khaltsoi will be my mom's clan, which takes first quarter of my life. I also introduce my dad's clan, which also takes care of my second quarter of my life. I also introduce my maternal grandparents, which takes care of my third quarter. And finally, I also introduce my paternal grandparents, to reflect on who reflect on who we are as Dene, as we officially call ourselves. That was on airplane mode, believe it or not. <clears throat> Modern Indian. So, as we look at this beautiful design. Transpose that particular design to this. Our beautiful rugs, we call it the yoga. We'll come to be is that we, we listen to different archaeologists, anthropologists, 
scholars, they have their own way of thinking how we got to be here in the beautiful Southwest and how we got to learn the beautiful technique of weaving. In our beliefs, Spider Woman, a sun nash, um, a sun, officially taught us how to weave. And her husband, Spider Man, not Batman, Spider Man, brought the gift of the vertical loom. I was raised both on my maternal and my paternal family that were both weavers. This vest that I'm wearing actually was worn by my dad. My dad's mother was a weaver, Chanel. My grandmother was also a weaver's daughter, Sani, yeah. And there's some, there are men weavers as well. So we've got to respect that as well. So in order for a grandmother, an auntie, a mother, to carry that tradition, if a child comes in, we save the umbilical cord and the placenta to be buried probably around in the vicinity of the sheep corral. In the back of our mind, there are spiritual beliefs. We're always thinking about this young, young child to be a weaver. If we bury her umbilical cord around that particular corral, it always draws her back to her center of the universe, to her family, to her kinship, and to the Bekeya, to Navajo land. In the art of thinking, we're taught not to kill spiders, not stay. We do just the opposite. Sometimes we'll grab, my grandmother will grab the grandmothers, will grab a spider, massage the fingers, the elbows, the hands on this young baby. And theoretically, hopefully that she will become a weaver. Same thing with the web. Not straight, but Lord. Which today, we see this beautiful design proposed and designed by Not straight, a son. Which is used officially to give as a gift for our ceremonies. Oh, many ceremonies. So as we emerge through the underworld, this is us. As we proceeded through the, um, the clouds, the rainbow, you know, the, the rainbow arching out. And then this is our people migrating and to expand. Boy, did we expand. Today, we're looking at 300,000 Navajos occupying four corners of our southwest. 25 to 27,000 square miles of our Danetka. So now, as we're familiar with our surrounding, a lot of our ancestors is reaching out, learning the surrounding, and also to start weaving the gift of Spider Woman. The first step that we brought forth is actually the clothing that we'll wear to keep us warm. The ponchos, the blankets. As we look in our history, I think the most often that's recognized will be the four, or not even the four, but um, the third phase chief's blanket, right? We're familiar with that. But levels before that, there are a lot of weaving that were done. Sarapi, Sarapi. Sarapi in Navajo, 
We call it a wuss beltle, a shoulder blanket. And then the bigger blanket is not ani bebeltle, chief's blanket. We're often asked, oh, wait up, we, uh, you don't have chiefs. Say, hey, you're right, we don't. But what we did is that we filtered to the more of who will have the most monetary gifts or trade. And usually it's the man in charge. That's usually the chief or the commander at, at that time. So we also starting to, to bring in the gifts of the four-legged chiro sheep, which today we don't have that many left. We're trying to rebreed. The chiro sheep is probably one of the best of any that will provide wool. Natural color, bringing brown, beige, gray, off-white, and black. Well, you see a lot of that in the earlier chief's blanket. Phase number one was simply just lines straight across. To a weaver, they will rather add designs to it rather than doing a straight, a straight line. Because straight lines, believe it or not, is more, you have to be a lot more accurate with your lines. If you add geometric pattern, that becomes easy because now you're counting your weft. Makes it easier. In order to get a full-size blanket, if you unravel the weft threads, 900 in 72 yards of hand spun, one ply wool. That's quite a bit. And we're on average seven to eight pounds of wool. So a weaver, if she's doing it traditionally, of course now we have commercial wool, pre-spun, aniline dyes, natural wool, and pastels. They all came to be according to what we have during different time period. Before the long walk, I'm sure you're familiar with the long walk, Huelte, Bosque Waldando. A lot of our mothers, grandmothers, aunties weave blankets, sarapi, uh, Women's clothing, bil, as we call it. Usually in simple colors. Red, black, and white. We often hear that, oh yeah, they, they, they learn their method through weaving of a certain vegetal. Basketry is the oldest of any art form, before rugs, before cheeks like before sarapi. As we look at our, our, our sumac, in order to get the color black, sumac, a little bit of orchard, yellow, red, and J, we call it J. That sticky stuff. Um, boil all into this to get to this color, black. The red, we use the old mahogany root. A little mixture of this, of that, and we get more of your maroonish color. So from that to this was actually a lot easier because you already knew the colors. So if I actually did the circle into a square form, that was an easy transition. So before a long walk, during the long walk, and then the period of four years, which is probably the darkest hour, we begin to see a lot of different design coming in. Blankets have been brought in from the army 
uh, Mexican blanket are coming in with different design. And then we get into the aniline dye that's already been, been given to us and so forth. So we're slowly changing with time. And also from the beginning, we knew the art of the red color, cochinilla, which has been extracted by a bug from Mexico. Which that cochinilla was actually commercially dyed into these big old bolt of, of material where my people, they, they actually unraveled and respun the wool. The wool in Navajo, we call it the Beh Baga. So churro is our favorite because it produces a lot of lengthier fiber. During season, for usually the first year, the second year, they produce a lot of lengthy wool from the shoulder all the way to the back and underneath. But there's another batch right underneath as well that is just a lot more smaller, but you got to be very careful. So you have to blend that together into the wool. So usually there will be grays, blacks, white, beige, and brown. But we haven't really started combining and carding yet as we, as we start to learn after the Bosque Orondando. <laughs> And there's so many that I actually transpose between our long walk and how we're starting to, to phase into different traders. So we're actually progressing to um, traders that are coming in late 1800s. And the, the, I think the most famous will be um, uh, Ganado Hubble Trading Post. At that time, what is not ani bebeltle? The big blanket is actually fading out. Around the time period of during the the Bosque Orondo, different material material or material is coming in, including velveteen kind of changed the way that we wore velveteen as a traditional shirt, dress. My people still wear that today. Not, not the reminder of what have occurred, but the reminder that we were strong. Survive of what 8,000 of my people walked, 4,000 made it back. From that, now a different method is coming. Uh, we stopped trading with the Mexican. We stopped trading with the armies. Uh, a, new, a new system is coming in. We're starting to establish Nalgeha Bajo One trading post. That trading post, the gentleman likes more of the red. Oh, we can't produce red. We can't produce anything that's dark in color. Dark green, dark red, dark blue. It's all been brought in. Whether it's in commercial color or an aniline packet, there's two ways of doing this. So from caring for that sheep, during around the month of late March, April, we shear the sheep. And the end result of that is that we average about, about 10 pounds, well, even less than that, 6 to 8 pounds of, of wool. When they faded out our favorite sheep, and always talk about the BC, you know, BC, they always talk about before Christ, but we have our own time pattern. You know, BC before conquistadors, you know, before Columbus. <laughs> so it, it's, 
it was a factor that things were changing for us. We're no longer, we're talking about the red color, the blue color, the green color. We have to uh, change our method through doing commercial yarn, which is a lot easier. But when you start shearing your sheep, cleaning your sheep, holy moly, that's a lot of work. You have to wash your wool. And during that time, we only have yucca soap with suds, and we don't want it to, to wash very clean because we wash that lanolin now. We need that lanolin. That lanolin makes it stronger and lasts longer. And then from washing, drying, it, that all takes its toll, hours upon hours. The washing and then, of course, drying and then, if, and then carding. Carding is probably the most time-consuming. A lot of work. You know, you gotta, you got to card your, your wool. I, I brought some carding tools. Bechatn chad, as we call it, navo. A lot of work. Because you got to have a lot of strength on your upper body to do this. Because if you do too much of this, it grabs. So you got to be talented of, of doing this. So the weaver has to be strong, not only that by capturing the chiro wool, the chiro sheep, because they're strong itself. They're very athletic. So it takes one to two, maybe three people to shear, manual shear. You got to have good forearms, good arms, and they were fit during those times from washing. And of course, you got to get the yucca fiber. It has to be done in a certain way because there's all the traditional beliefs in it. The teaching of, of, of Spider Woman is that during our winter months, in order to have this coordination, because a lot of the design has not been mapped out or have a blueprint or to be drawn out. It's got to be from our heart to our minds. During the winter time, we allow it to do na'atlo, string games, to get this coordination. I can show you, which I can't, is to do a rug with string games without looking at it. So in term, a lot of the weavers, they already know in their heart what they're going to weave. At times, they don't know until they touch. There's a lot of, of your do's, your don'ts, your taboos, and such. So in order to, to rectify that, you've got to render your prayers and your songs. Very, very important. So after carding... Spinning is probably one of the most time-consuming. And, you know, it's just um, this one goes towards you. Now, it depends who you talk to. And then the wool that you spin will do the opposite side. So the hand spun theoretically goes the opposite way. So if you look at a rug, it should be spun this way. But I have talked to a lot of weavers. They actually have done both ways. The spindle going towards you, and then the wool also going towards you. What I've been told by my my grandmother and my paternal grandmother is, see, you're actually facing the spindle towards you. I don't not, but meaning it's spinning the opposite way of you. But then again, we have left-handed weavers, and we have right-handed weavers. So it's not really official of how you're going to actually spin because we, we look at wool and say, oh, is it actually pre-spun? Is it naturally spun? It's hard, to, it's hard to detect today. From your spinning and washing, 
And then you gotta you gotta do your loom. Loom is also very time consuming because when you do your carding, you gotta do a one ply of your average size, three by five. When you unravel that three by five, which is a good size, it's about 400 yards of wool. So it's time consuming, very, very time consuming. Not any beltle, bebeltle, it takes almost half a year to weave a full size blanket. So that hopefully will make us appreciate the time that puts into our weaving. <clears throat> so from that, the phasing in and phasing out. After we've been released from Bosque uh, Rodando, and then of course now there are several our training posts have started to develop. The one that's probably the most popular is Two Grey Hills, uh, not Two Grey Hills, but um, Ganado. Look, Antkeil. <coughs> Mr. Hubble really admired of more red. I said, man, we can't do red. Give us a break. <laughs> it's just because it takes a lot of time. Vegetally, it takes a lot of time. So what he did is that he actually had connections as well to be to bring in either commercial spun wool or the aniline down packet wool, which also takes a lot of work to produce that. So, so it is changing to where now we like our wool to represent who we are. On some old baskets, we see these little square, and even more square with more square. That was the representation and honoring Nashje Asta, Spider Woman. Where we have Jitkin, Jehunt, a pathway, spirit line. It's always been embedded already. We have a spirit line ourselves. Whatever was done in our way of belief, the way of life, traditionally, culturally, facing towards the east to render our prayers, recognizing the partnership of Mother Earth, Father Sky. So when Mr. Hubble was starting to do a lot of the um, the wanting of of we would never wove anything that's more of a small size, but then the Harvey, the railroads, it's coming in. Harvey hotels are starting to develop, and they like something to take home rather than looking at a huge blanket. There's really no need for that, so we decided to do the floor blankets. But to this day, we see what has become Ganado red. Mr. Hubble really admire red. And within that, we establish borders. We didn't really understand borders. We always have this free-flowing, in our blankets, it's always an outlet, G18. So what we got here, the Ganado red, and they usually add a little cross here to signify the home of Spider Woman. We don't do it as much anymore. And also to recognize that we did have emerged from the underworld. And this is our present world working to the next world through the, the eye of our umbilical cord, which takes, takes a lot of time and you know, the beliefs, the traditional beliefs, the taboos and such. And I always tell everybody that I'm, now I'm cordless because I, I put my umbilical cord in, in, in a corral. So same thing from what we have here as a pattern is actually transposed. 
we're actually emerging out as well. You see a lot of this geometric pattern, which you'll see right over there. A lot of times we'll signify our sacred mountains and our clouds. The rainbow arching, a lot of times it's just arching as well. And so what, they, what they've become is that um, this will reflect of our four sacred mountains. Sisna Jinnah, Dok Oslid, Sont Zif, the Ben Tsa. They're all been signified in here. But then again, when you talk to different weavers, you probably have different answers as well. So that's just the basic of, of the Ganado with a border within a border within a border. And the black is actually pretty much natural from the Chiro sheep at that time. But now to make it even darker, we add a little bit of um, tree sumac. Works very well. Pinion pitch works very well. Coffee grain works very well. Orchard works very well. So you got all these weapons to get this. So, so usually a lot of the, the reds will actually be commercial dyed. And usually with this, sometimes we'll add a savage weft to keep it parallel. So as a buyer, you, link, you want everything to balance itself where it should be centered, darn close. Looking at the corners, we did a really good job. But you got to keep in mind, though, it's hand done. Ganada red became to be the first regional to come out. So if you're not familiar with Ganado, Luc Ahantkeil is actually in Arizona. I'm sure you know that already, right? <coughs> Within that region, there's also a lot of trading posts to develop, developing. The one that's probably more familiar with is Crystal, Twinsel. Another trader wanted to do something that's um, a little different from Ganado red, to stay away from the reds. One of the earlier rugs that they're trying to establish was actually bordered. Try to come up. Okay, so I don't have a crystal, but if you look at this, they're almost identical, right? In pattern, almost. If I compare it to like another clagato, and have it in black and white, he got the basic ingredients of the square or geometric pattern in the center. You got your four sacred mountains, the four houses of winds, all connected. The only difference between what I have in my hand and in her hand is that this is all natural wool color. You knew that already, right? So we're looking at a savage weft here. And then again, that's to keep everything in parallel. We want a, a, a perfect rug. That's the only way we can buy it. So if, if there's a natural to be done, we're looking at your basic white, black, and brown. That's all we need. To get to our shading in our carding process, if it's done naturally, 
the more white you add to your um, to your to your white determines your shading. White to your brown, a lighter shade to variate your design. Same thing with your white and your black. The more white you add to your black also you, determines the shading of grays. In early 1900, another trader established two gray hills, and I usually like the two diamonds to set aside what is Ganado and let's see, get another Clagato here, and a Clagato. Oh, here we go. Another regional, if it's black and white, it'll look the same. The only difference is that this could be, is it a two gray hills? It has grays in it. Is it Ganado red? Because it has reds in it. It has shading of natural color. Is it two gray hills? What Clogato did is that they actually did gray background. And two Ganado red. Two gray hills and Clogato. They almost look the same, but if you look at the pattern, they all differ. Beautiful, huh? We can put this in the back. So Ganado Red is first, Crystal second, two gray hills, and this little area. So we start to establish a lot of regional areas. Distinctively, depending on where you're at on our reservation, some are a little more semi-dry arid, and some are a little more vegetated. In this area, Tlagatua, wide ruins, Ganado, Pine Spring, burnt water, they're relatively known for vegetal dyes. Here's your Pine Springs, there's your burnt water. Let's see here, we got Tlagatua um, and wide ruins. What's different between them is that especially with wide ruins, pine spring, crystal, and chendle, they're borderless. So in that area, they're a lot more vegetable. More vegetable dyes, you got a lot more vegetation. But this one here is East Nuzbas. Try it, East Nuzbas. Hey, very good. Sometimes I hear Tisno's posts, <laughs> right? But it's East Nuzbas. But what they've done is that we're actually combining, and they always say it's the least looking Navajo rug. <laughs> it looks Persian y. But we have a wide band of our border. And then we have all this razzle-dazzle to differ from your ganado, from your tigre, from your clagato. What we managed to do from Tis Nuzbans is that we want it to be different. Just like an artist. We wanted something to always differ from another artist. So that's the accomplishment of what we've done here. But have you noticed? Where it's crucial, in most cases, they say, oh, I don't want to buy this rug because it doesn't have a pathway. Well, I've been told that if a grandmother have taught the mother 
now teaching the granddaughter or the daughter the method of weaving. Left to right, left to right, left to right, left to right. And we're looking at the things to be learned is that if you're learning my grandmother or my mother or my auntie's design, it's not mine yet. You're not ready for a teen. You're not ready yet. Until you get to that level, you're eligible. You can do that. But then again, it depends on who you talk to, how they've been raised, how they've been taught. Is it necessary? From the old blankets, not Anibabeltle, they were borderless. Now we have a border. And then, as you outline our reservation, we have a border. It has all the similarities, unfortunately. So within this area of vegetation, that's also very crucial. A lot of work. I think the most common dye is your golden hues. Cliff rose is a veg vegetation that we like. A white al, as we call it in Navajo. That will give you a golden color of shade. Starting out in the morning, chopping your wood, get a five gallon can bucket, hopefully an iron bucket rather than aluminum, because it does release acid. Get about two pounds worth of your cliff rose, everything, the bark, the leaf, mesh into the water, boil it for about two hours, roughly. Sometimes they add um, baking soda. And then finally, add your wool. Boil it a low boil, depending on how deep you want to go. And it sort of like represents the, the, the intensity of the color. It's like brewing your tea. The more you brew it, the darker it is. The less you brew it, the lighter the color. But it's not that simple, though, because it will take probably one to several days to variate your the kind of color that you're going to get. The one that's very popular also is ah, because you have to ferment the color overnight. Mind-boggling. It's a lot of work. So that's also an appreciation. So with all that, we cover the, the borders versus the borderless. Now we're at the vegetal state versus your all-natural wool color. And then we also touch more on your aniline color, which is a lot easier, I think, if you're a weaver, rather than you know, spinning, weaving, carding, which consists. If you can actually get about eight pounds of, of wool during your spinning process, a whooping 90 hours. It's going to take you 90 hours to spin. So now, a lot of the, the inner side of our weft threads, they start to sell us cotton warp. A lot easier in most cases. So now, one weaver will, will reflect on what is natural weft thread and cotton threads. 90 hours, over the counter. <laughs> natural dyes, over the counter. 
So it makes you appreciate the time that goes into it. So by that, let's see here. Give me a vegetal day. So right here, that vegetal. So when we establish all the regional, you won't get to see this on the map. Pastels, really pretty. There's an area on a reservation, but right in this area, we also encircle the Pueblo of Hopi. Actually, it's just a, they don't want to be called Pueblo, the Hopis. And there's always a border. You on this side, I on this side. During the Bennett Freeze land, what's the official term? Um, where they're trying to get the Navajo back on this side and Hopi back on this side, but says, hey, wait up, there's too many. We got to relocate, relocate you. So based on all this traditional minded and based on trading posts, this comes around 1980, new land. What makes it different is that not only that we actually do the raised outline, which is by far differ, and then vegetal, which makes it differ. So if I get this particular design and a burnt water, let's see if I can get a burnt water. Let's see. I don't have a burnt water. Just assume that I have a burnt water. <laughs> see, my burnt water will be vegetally dyed. This is all pastels. Raised outline. So one is negative, one is positive. So if you flip it over, look at that. So this is in the hand of your multiple heddles. So by that, we will go back to your borderless. Basic design, the center is always in the middle. Emergence, home of Spider Woman, which I'm sure you've been to Canyon de Chez. Have you been to Canyon de Chez? Visit Spider Rock, home of not Shea's son. Very real, very, very real. And we have done fillers within this. And then also your geometric pattern, which also in reflection, going back to uh, our sacred mountains, going back to the, 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 grus, the, uh, the roots of this basket. From Yoka Stan as a gift to Spider Woman. Officially, they don't have a training post to speak of, but it's in the Sanders area. And that's the last regional that is not documented on our beautiful layout on our res. Okay. So we're starting to do a lot of non-traditional designs. And I say non-traditional, yay. You, you probably have a, a rug yay, right? Yeah, you. There's two styles. One will have a white background, and one will have natural wool background. The birthplace will be around shiprock. Shiprock, and this is actually yay. Biche versus Yay. 
Yea, in Navajo means holy one. There are spiritual messengers for the upper God to defuse what's ailing the body. Yea, Biche is the grandfather of the Holy One. So this is more of a natural form, Ye Biche, versus Ye, more of a digital form. Against policies, taboo. We're searching in an outlet to bring something different from all of our regionals. Sometimes, you know, you can actually tell a yay with a rainbow arching b below the yay, which is usually from look ajikai. Say look ajikai, not look chuki. I always, <laughs> always hear that look chuki, look chuki, look ajikai. So, in variation, is that um. One is Ye, usually the birthplace in Shiprock, and then Ye Biche will be from Luk Ajikai. You can always tell the difference, but now you can actually get a weaver from Ganado and weave a two gray hills. What they're trying to get to is in tapestry form. Meaning, it took more work, re-spinning, to make it even finer. Per weft inch, in order to be classified as a tapestry, you got to count 80 wefts per inch. That's a lot of weaving. One of the master weavers they can do over a hundred wefts per inch. A couple thousand dollars. But on average, we're only averaging about, if we're lucky, six to eight dollars an hour. Spending three to four hundred hours. Hopefully that if you have rugs, you'll appreciate what you have. Okay, that's it. Thank you. My, um, introduce yourself. I said, hello, my name is Tashina, and I am born for the, I don't know it in English, <laughs> but I know it in Navajo, yeah, um, born for the Water Edge clan, the Red Running Into the Water People clan, my Maternal clan is Red Wedding into the Water People clan, and my Nulla clan is the Black People clan, Black Sheep People clan. And I'm from Gallup, New Mexico. I'm full blooded Navajo, and I work closely with Andrew Sosi. Thomas, I, Thomas. I'm sorry, Andrew Thomas, yes, I apologize. It's even, it's even more Navajo now, <laughs> Sosi. <laughs> and I do work for the um, American Indian Chamber of Commerce. And then, Assisting uh, Andrew here. Thank you. Yes. I'll take a question. I think this is a little insulting, but the older rugs had what they called lazy lines. Um, okay. I don't remember the explanation of what that was about. Very good. Lazy line. You gotta understand the, the, the geometry or the, the construction of the loom. And you can't advance this way and you can't advance this way. So the weaver has to go with the weaving across. Left, right, left, right, left, right. If you have a big, large rug, it's easier to stay in one place up to this level, and then find, okay, you have to do the rest. So that lazy line um, develops. It's a good question. I actually and like that. I like that. In it, it's, it's, it has a characteristic. So, so in order to take care of your rugs, periodically, you can actually uh, moth-proof your rugs. Very easy to do. 
put it in a plastic bag, uh, moth, moth balls, tie it up, and leave for a week, two weeks, air it out, and you're, you're done. And once in a while, you lightly vacuum your, your rugs, never shake it, because you can actually break the corners. And if you break a corner, you're going to cry, because it's going to unravel on you. Don't shake your rugs. And the safest way you can actually put on a wall is actually you can Velcro your, your, your wall, take it off, one year, reverse it, so I'll have it even wear. Any questions? I guess it's the severity of your area. If you, if you notice there's a lot of moths, uh, I would say one year is good. But you got to check. If you're actually vigilant on it by reversing and keeping an eye and lightly vacuum, you should be in good shape. Can you repeat the question so we can, uh, we can hear what they're asking? What's the proper technique and how often you should actually mouth, uh, mouth, <laughs> moth? proof your rugs and it's depending on your severity and your location if you notice there's a lot of moths you can actually moth proof your rugs half a year to a year and if you're vigilant on it where you lightly vacuum it you reverse it every year make sure it's not in the sunlight you should be in good shape should be Uh-huh. For black, uh, you were connecting, you're starting with the basket and then going over to uh, weaving. On basketry, I've heard that also for black, and I'm wondering if this is true or in Navajo, they use um, the black seed of yucca for a black paint. I think, and then again... I, I think it's, and then again, re reflecting back to your location, the black, if you go on the res and you find a snake weed, very popular. See, most vegetal that we come upon back home, there's over 80 <coughs> vegetal dyes. One area of the same plant will variate in terms of color. So what we know to get the black is that the black chiro sheep or the sheep itself will have more uh, a dark brown black. So we add sumac, which is very traditional. Orchard, which is also traditional because we have that available. And if you were talking about those berries, if we have that available, we'll use it. But I don't, I, don't, I don't know if we have actually have used that. So that's a good point, too, that if you have vegetal, if you have, like, natural um, fruits, um, you have to do it even more immediately because the color will differ from an overnight. Got to be quick on it. Any more questions? When you buy and purchase a rug, it's always nice to know where it's coming from. And that particular stamp is like a trademark to separate you know, the, the imitations, because we see a lot of imitations, quite a bit. If we put a tag on it, and if it states it's a certificate of authenticity from this particular artist, and I think as a buyer, I feel more confident of buying a rug or any art. For as what we have on our rugs is not only a certificate of authenticity, also the tag stating that um, it is genuine that we have purchased from a particular weaver. So I think with that trademark and copyright is to protect us as well uh, of 
this is genuine. And at the cultural center, we also, in the Shemak Olawa gifts, we make darn sure that we deal directly with the artists. No, it's. It was my my dad's mother, Shanelle, oh. So if you're starting to do a lot of the geometric pattern, it's a lot easier to do rather than straight lines. So in, in a situation like this, it's easier to count your weft threads in your lines. So the more of your razzle-dazzles, um, to a weaver, this is easy. Because you're counting your weft threads. So a lot of the weavers are actually good mathematicians. And a multiple of fours, fives, tens, twenty, and it's easier. But believe it or not, they have no clue of what they're going to actually weave until they face that rug. You can't sing through it, you can't talk through it, but you can pay, uh, pray to it. Any more questions? Way in the back. The most popular that's been recognized and is often sought after will be two gray hills. Two gray hills, you can actually respun your wool twice, even three times, to make it into a tapestry. And it's more often recognized because it's the only rug on the market today that's all natural wool color. Your black, your white, and your brown. Depending on how much you add your wool with your black determines your shading of grays. The same thing with brown. One more questions? When were the pictorials introduced and were they encouraged by the trading post? Yes. And See, a lot of the regional area, they want to be different. I think this is one of the most common design, which pictorial, uh, like, um, where's my sand painting record? Sand painting, sand painting, sand painting, sand painting. Sand painting, shiprock, hosting claw, decided to document sand paintings, assuming that he's thinking that um, it might fade out someday. So we have to doc document is not only on paper, but also on rugs. And they start to establish like a pictorial. This is probably the most common of, of design, which reflect on Ha'aznande emerging from the underworld. And Navajos believe that they have reached through that reed to get to this level. As you notice the birds, we're on the outside. As we emerging from the underworld, the birds decided or decide as a unit to, to stay on the outside to this day. The birds, they're still on, on the outside. And this is from um, a sand painting from Blessing Way, where Georgia it's used. And usually all the, um, the sand paintings, or in this particular pictorial, they're all commercial dyes. The yellow, the green we can actually do sage and such, but overall, if, if we do vegetal dyes today and get all the plants, there will be a shading of yellows. Yellows to golden hue colors. Hopefully I answer your question. Yes, sir. Cotton was used from the beginning, and I don't want to get too scholarly on that, but yes. Um, we, um, they, um, supposedly that we have learned weaving from the Pueblos, 
And that was, you know, with the Pueblo Revolt, 1680-ish, and a lot of the, the Pueblos revolted, or not revolted, but um, uh, um, refuge to either to Navajo land or to Hopi or different tribes for, for you know, to save their lives. And that's how supposedly that um, the Pueblo men weave with cotton. So that probably concludes uh, our, our presentation. I know there's a lot to talk about. It, it takes hours and hours. This is just little bits and pieces. But I think with this presentation, we'll make you appreciate all the artwork that you see. Don't look at the price tag, but look what's behind that price tag, whether it's pottery, rugs, silver work, and things of that nature. So um, thank you so much. You can actually look us up on shemakolua.com or just um, we'll get your email. We can actually shoot you an email about this presentation and things of that nature. And thank you for coming to the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center. <laughs>